Well, good evening. On behalf of the Metropolitan New York Presbytery, I welcome you to tonight's ordination service. I'm very glad you could be with us to join in what is uh, meant to be a joyous occasion. Anytime somebody is ordained, it's a time uh, to recognize God's kindness. And so on the one hand, our gathering tonight is, a, is an opportunity to celebrate Philip Dennis and the years of work uh, that it took to get him here, seminary, uh, prayer, preparation, uh, internship, papers, exams. And so all of that work is to be recognized and to be commended. It's an opportunity for us to rejoice with this church, New Hope Christian Church, uh, who for years uh, has been waiting for somebody to come and serve in this capacity. And Philip has faithfully been serving, uh, but the church has patiently been waiting for an ordained minister who could uh, serve the sacraments with frequency. And so this is a time for us to rejoice for this congregation. Uh, but of course, rather than simply coming and, and uh, celebrating and acknowledging all of the good things that have happened and what we expect to happen, the first thing we do is we pause to celebrate the one who is calling Dennis to the ministry, the one who uh, is gathering the church. And so it's appropriate that when we do ordination, we do it in the context of a worship service. Because the God who called Philip with the gospel to believe in Jesus Christ is also the God who called him to serve the church. The God who gathers us all, to say, who says, because of what Christ has done, you can draw near as a people that are now my people. Uh, these are the reasons that we're here. And so as we come to, uh, to celebrate this time and to put Philip apart for uh, the future of his ministry, we also take the time to give thanks to the God who is really the hope uh, of this church, uh, of our denomination, and of God's people throughout the ages. And so I invite you to join in worshiping God. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Tonight is a small picture of God's faithfulness, of his kindness to us. And so I invite you to stand and let's begin by singing a portion of Psalm 146.
because of the mercies of the Lord that were not consumed. And our confession this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah uh, describes that in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Isaiah says, Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It's because of the grace of God that we can come clean and confess our sins, so let's do that as I lead us. Lord Jesus, it's true that when we see you in your glory, when we see you honestly from the perspective of humility, we cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty and the whole earth is filled with your glory. And at the same time, we notice that we are a people of unclean lips, unclean eyes, defiled hands, feet that are slow to do your will and quick to run in the opposite direction. And we recognize that we are unclean and in need of your cleansing power, your blood shed on the cross. So, Lord, we confess to you our uncleanness, our guilt, our shame. And, Lord Jesus, we give you heartfelt thanks and praise that you've provided the perfect atonement for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And we give you thanks in the name of Christ. Good evening. I bring you greetings from the North Shore of Long Island and the congregation of the North Shore Community Church in Oyster Bay, New York. And it is a privilege to be with you tonight. And I share a little bit of excitement. I can't imagine how excited all of you are. And it is a privilege for me to just read the scriptures to you tonight. The reason it's such a privilege is because as our presbytery learned more and more about your church, we learned how much you love and value God's word. And as you transitioned into our denomination, there was careful attention by your elders and by the body of this church. What do the scriptures say is what we heard again and again so humbly asked as you have taken this journey. So 
On behalf of our presbytery, we are just thrilled that you're a part of our communion. And I personally am thrilled to know Philip Dennis, to hear him give careful and thoughtful answers to many questions, answering us from the scriptures that he loves so much. So, that little speech having been said, I want to read then from an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Familiar, I'm sure, to your words, to your ears. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So ends the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Well, fathers and brothers, Philip, dear Christian friends of the New Hope Church, uh, I don't know how many ordination sermons the Apostle Paul would have attended. Have you ever wondered that? Must have been quite a few. But by the time he writes the letter, to Titus that I'm going to read from. He's a man who surely must know that his days are numbered and his race is almost run. Would you turn with me in your Bible to Paul's letter to Titus chapter 3. I'm 
actually going to read uh, beginning in verse 1 and down to verse 11. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. I wonder if you noticed uh, just how nitty-gritty the Apostle Paul gets in that passage. Of course, when he writes this letter uh, to Titus, he gives him the express reason in chapter 1, verse 5. I wonder if you noticed that or had read it before sometime. He says to Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. Philip, that is your task now, as you are on the verge of entering into the Christian ministry. You follow in the train of Titus and Timothy before you to put in order what remains. Fathers and brothers, uh, I know that we understand that that's not as simple as it sounds. It uh, sometimes seems like you're building a wall with bananas, right? Uh, just as soon as one part is all squared away, something else is slipping. And nevertheless, Paul has supreme confidence in Jesus Christ building his church, and incidentally, in the method through which Titus is going to primarily use to put in order what remains. And although it wasn't explicitly stated in this passage, if you are familiar with or take the time to read all of the letter to Titus, all 46 verses of it, and the two letters to Timothy, all of which were written about the same time at the very end of Paul's ministry, he says nothing in there to the next generation of pastors and teachers about priestcraft. Building the church of Jesus Christ calls for one spiritual gift. That's what he highlights the only spiritual gift you'll find in the pastoral epistles is that of aptitude or ability to teach the Word of God. And the only task, or at least the primary task, to which Paul charges Titus and Timothy is the task of preaching and teaching the Word of God. And as that Word is taught to you, and as that Word is received by you and used by one another to teach each other, then you will surely grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you noticed near the end of this passage, Paul said in verse 8, I want you to insist on these things. That these things that he's talking about are what I'll elucidate in a moment. It's basically one sentence, verses 3 to 7 in your English Bible. It's a wonderful summary of the gospel. That's the these things that, that Paul says you are to insist on. But, but notice... I want you to notice two things very simply today about this passage. The first is, is that when Paul instructs Titus and through his word is instructing you, brothers and sisters of the New Hope Church, and fill up you as you come to stand before God to take these vows, he's instructing you in the gospel so that something would happen in your lives. 
Philip is not going to take some vows in a moment so that he can become a champion of esoterics. That's not the idea. Uh, people have sometimes in our tradition confused amassing knowledge with what God is asking of us as his people. And as a minister of the gospel, I would be remiss if I didn't say how valuable the teaching and the doctrine of the Bible is. It's indispensable to growth, obviously. But the point of receiving the teaching the point of insisting on these things is, did you notice near the end of this passage, in verse 8, so that you may devote yourself to good works. What is it that's going to change the lives of the people that you know? What is it about the work of the gospel that is going to make a difference in your home, in your school, in your workplace, in your neighborhood? You see, the acid test of Christianity is whether it works in everyday life. And the encouragement to you this evening is that what Paul is calling your pastor to and what he is calling you to is to be noticed as a witness for him in some extraordinarily simple, way, simple ways. Did you, did you notice what you're being called to as a, as a congregation beginning in verse 1? to be a witness for Jesus Christ and to stand out as a person through whom his gospel has changed your life requires things as simple as not speaking evil of anyone. Things as simple as not quarreling. Things as simple as being gentle and showing courtesy to all people. Is that within your reach? Well, you may read the book of James and wonder sometimes if it is, but Paul is confident that as the word of God takes its hold in you, particularly as you dwell on the, these things that we'll get to in a moment, that that will change you. That you will show through your life that there is a Jesus, that he is the Messiah that was promised from long ago, and that the work that he does in people's lives makes all the difference. Human beings are a race that are characterized by the search for something. For some people, that search is in the large terms, the conquest of space, science's new horizons, for many people, it's more personal, for promotion, family satisfaction. The Bible says that ultimate search finds its answer only in Jesus Christ, and that will be seen to be true to the extent that what Titus gives to you, these charges, come out through the pores of your everyday life. Now, these charges are for your pastor also, and I have to tell you, I take no small satisfaction in the end of this passage, partly because I dare to hear myself that, that Philip is charged specifically, and you through him, to be people who avoid foolish controversies. I don't think you're in danger about genealogies, perhaps, but the foolish controversies. I, what can we say? Our tradition is a glorious one, and God has given us to steward so many of the riches of his grace, but it has we must say, sometimes been marred. And I wonder how many of our late night discussions would have been excised if we had heeded more carefully the apostles' advice. I'm not going to give you my list of foolish controversies, but just so you don't come away empty handed, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a helpful little booklet in his lifetime called What is an Evangelical? You may know that Martin Lloyd-Jones was a pastor for many years in Center City, London, and many people consider him one of the godliest and most effective pastors in the English language in the 20th century. And among the things that he considered to fall into the category of secondary and therefore not worth dividing people over, spending time hashing these things out, often heatedly, were the gifts and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, various theories on the end times, the mode and timing of baptism, Interestingly, election and predestination. You can shift in your seat uncomfortably if you're a minister of the gospel, the PCA perhaps, but it's something to think about, to be careful of these things. Why? Because the things that you want to insist on, the things that are going to make the difference in your life, are the things that come between those two sets of exhortations. Did you notice the way that Paul explains what it is that's going to bring out in you a life that not only is pleasing to God, but a life that shines for him, 
in the place where he's called you to be. He explains it beginning in verse 3, starting in the most unpleasant terms. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, hating, and being in hated. That's not very easy to hear. He says in the verses following that, that whatever things that you have done, and, and you notice that he doesn't concentrate on the bad things that you have done after that. He instead says that even the best things that you have done, the, the works that you have done in righteousness, even those things are not to be credited to you before God at all. Did you notice that? That, that you were saved not because of the works that you had done in righteousness. When Nicodemus came to Jesus in a passage that was read to you before, you may know that it was at night, and some scholars think that partly that was because Nicodemus may have recognized the symbolism in the light and the darkness, that in the darkness of his own life, without meaning, without a savior, that he understood that he needed to seek out in some way Jesus, even though he didn't fully understand who he was. Whatever the reason, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he doesn't look like the kind of person on the surface that Titus is talking about. Nicodemus was a respected man in his community. He was, a, he was outwardly speaking, a godly man. He would have been scrupulous in his attendance and his knowledge of the scriptures and his giving to God. He would have been considered to be, in his day, an exemplary Christian. And yet Jesus says to him, you must be born again. And that's at the heart of this passage. Did you notice the way that Paul puts it? He says in verse 5, in the center of all that he has to say, what is going to change you? What is it you must insist on? What is it you must dwell on? Is that as God has saved us, he has saved us how? According to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That word regeneration is the same language as being born again. What? Jesus says has to happen to Nicodemus or to anyone if they were to have entrance into the kingdom of God. But I find even more fascinating than that is a reference that Jesus makes to regeneration in Matthew's gospel. The only other time where the exact word here in Titus 3 is used, that word regeneration is found on the lips of Jesus in Matthew 19 where Jesus says to his Disciples, truly I say to you in the new world, what Jesus actually says is truly I say to you in the regeneration, truly what I say to you in the new birth, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me also will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And there Jesus is talking about the cosmic scope of God's work. That it begins in the human heart in the life of a man or of a woman, a boy or a girl, but it extends far beyond that, and its ripple effect goes out into all that God has made. What Jesus is saying is that God is going to take the creation that right now, Paul says, is groaning under the weight of sin and regenerate it to give it a new birth, not to discard it, but to renew it as it were, to wash it, to, to make it shine as it once did and more. You see, in the beginning, God first made the world. And then he made the people who were suited to live in that world. But now Jesus is saying, I'm doing the opposite. I'm making the new people first. And then one day, I'll make the new world. Because, you see, only the new people can live in the new world. As it was, Paul says, the way that we used to be, living in hatred, living for ourselves, being spiteful, living in misery with the guilt and the shame of our sin, our consciences that keep us awake, we could not gain entrance into God's kingdom. It was an occasion years ago when I was uh, talking to John Gerstner, who some of you will no, was a pastor of a previous generation known in our circles, and he was something of a scholar on Jonathan Edwards, and he had been spending many months on end in the uh, 
uh, Rare Books Library at Yale University studying the manuscripts of Jonathan Edwards. And there in the room with him, day after day, for much of this time, was a well-known historian and also an Edwards scholar who happened not to be a Christian. If you've ever read any of the sermons of Jonathan Edwards, which makes up the vast majority of what was left to us, they are deeply searching and incredibly incisive into the guilt of the human race and the only source of salvation in Jesus Christ. And the power of the language is almost overwhelming. On this one occasion, this man had asked Dr. Gerstner something and showed to Dr. Gerstner something of his unease over what he'd been researching. And Dr. Gerstner said to the man, I don't see how you sleep nights. And there was a pregnant pause and the man said, I don't much. Friends, the way to ensure that you will sleep like a baby is to see that what Jesus is offering to you in the new birth is to be a brand new person from the inside out. The difficulty, you see, once you have been given that new birth. Once God has changed you, as Nicodemus figured out for himself, he couldn't do it himself any more than a human baby can cause itself to be born. But once God has done that to you and you are a new person, you have now been given the charge, brothers and sisters of the New Hope Church, to live as new people in an old world. And you see, that is why your lives can stand out for Jesus Christ. That is why the attractiveness, the beauty that Paul talks about in verse 8, having insisted on these things and having believed in God that you may devote yourself to good works which are excellent and profitable. Literally, that that having devoted yourselves to these things, to having meditated and, and taken into the very center of who you are, what God has done for you is the beauty and the glory of the Christian life. Friends, the more that you think about the God of the Bible, the more amazed you will be that he might do that for you. Have you thought about what God is really like lately? There's an infinite number of ways to do that. Think about our galaxy as one example. If our galaxy were the size of the United States, the continent of the United States, then you could locate our solar system in that galaxy in the same relationship as a coffee cup to the continental United States. And astronomers tell us that there are billions of galaxies. And God's word tells us that he knows all of those stars by name. And this is the God that Paul says shows his loving kindness to you and saves you. How does he do that? How does God show his his lovingness, his determination to give of himself for your benefit, his kindness to you, his compassion to you? How does God show his mercy to you, his desire to relieve your suffering and your difficulty? Well, of course, he does it not through a what. God doesn't do it through an abstract character quality. He does it through his son, Jesus Christ. When God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. There was uh, a story told about Bernard Wetherill, who was, at the end of his life, honored with being nominated and received as the Speaker of the House of Commons in England. It's a position of great prestige, much like being the Speaker of the House is in the United States. And uh, Bernard Wetherill, because of that, enjoyed fame and uh, wealth. He entertained heads of state often before they would come to the House of Commons in his own home for dinner or for lunch. His mother had given him something because Bernard Wetherill's father had been a tailor. And so she gave her son Bernard a thimble. She said, I want you, and even if you're the Speaker of the House of Commons, don't you have to listen to your mother? She said, I want you to take this thimble and to put it in your pocket. And no matter who you're meeting with, 
no matter what you're talking about, no matter what the occasion is, if you feel something rising within you, if you feel something that's taking you away from who you are, I want you to put your palm in your pocket. And I want you to take that thimble into it and feel it. And to remember where you've come from, who you are. Philip, friends, you can't, you can't put the loving kindness of God in your pocket because it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself that is the loving kindness of God and it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is so immense that as was read before, it's as if the train of his robe engulfs this temple where we are to worship him. As he shows himself to you, as he comes near to you in his kindness and compassion sent by his Father to yield his lifeblood as an atonement for sin, it's at that moment when you consider what you once were and what you have now become through the mercy of God in Jesus Christ that has been poured out so lavishly on you by his spirit in answer to the prophecies that the men and women of old would scarcely dare to imagine could be true. It's, it's when you see that. It's when you revisit that. It's when you insist on. It's when you chew on and savor and digest that that you can recognize the holy God of the Bible as the one that you belong to. Despite your ongoing sin, despite the things that grieve him, do not cut you off from him, and you can say to him, here I am. Send me. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge to you what you already know, that there is nothing simple about putting our lives or the lives of your church in order, and yet, Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us your sovereign word that you will build your church. And we have come today because of your grace and loving kindness to see your church being built an answer to your promise. Father, I think that it must be true that for any number of us here there is great difficulty of one kind or another in our life. and We have been sent scrambling and looking for bedrock. We ask our God this morning that we would find it here is at the center of the heart of the Apostle Paul because it is the center of your heart. Your loving, kind determination to seek and save that which was lost. And when all else gives way, we can remember that you have not only said but have done that you have saved us. We therefore come and offer to you ourselves and our futures. And we ask that you would do with them what you would to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me the song of response that you'll find in your bulletin?
be seated. We're proceeding now to the ordination. Some of you might be saying, what is an ordination? It's a time when you make somebody a minister. How do you do that? Well, it's actually very simple. Uh, the elders gather around uh, Philip as he kneels down, and we, we'll lay our hands on him and set him apart for gospel ministry. It's something simple, uh, and yet, uh, while that happens very quick, it is, has taken years to get to this point. And the Bible tells us not to be hasty in the laying on of hands. And so it happens pretty quickly tonight, but will just be a few minutes of praying for Philip, uh, is something that actually is not carelessly done. And so, so just to give you some of the background of what it takes to uh, come to a moment like this, how does one discern a call to the ministry? Well, on the one hand, there's, there's a personal component where Philip himself needed to wrestle with a sense of the call of God. God calls people to himself and to follow Jesus Christ, but he sends us out to any of numerous places in the world. We can honor and serve God uh, at home with children, uh, in a doctor's office, uh, under an automobile. Uh, there are many ways to honor God with your life, but God sets some apart to leadership in the church. And so Philip had to wrestle with whether or not God was in fact calling him. And that meant that he needed to uh, find out a place to get theological training and go for seminary. He needed to find a church where he could exercise, exercise his gifts. He needed to pray. He needed to go back and forth with Blake about whether or not it's something that he should do and they should do and whether or not he was ready. And so, so Philip is a key party in this ordination. He's the one we're ordaining. But actually this church is another key component in the process of ordination because somebody shouldn't be ordained to the ministry unless a church calls them to the ministry. And so through his work here, where the members of this church have said, we have been encouraged by the work of Philip, we want to see him lead this church for a season. And the elders representing the church, uh, issuing that call will be part of that group in the front laying hands on him. And so, so the church uh, is as much of a part as Philip and his family and his friends. But then the final group that's part of this ordination in a representative manner is the presbytery. Our denomination divides itself by region, and the Presbytery is the local group in this area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And so we have a, a, a group here representing uh, that body who then does the due diligence to make sure that what sen Philip sensed was genuine, that his preparations were sufficient, that at this point, when he stands before uh, the congregation, he will teach what's sound and what's true that his character has been formed sufficiently that he will set before the church a godly example. And so the presbytery, having done that manner of work, is also the final ones that's here that will, will then take the part to, to, to ask Philip if he can make those promises, to ask the members of the church if they will receive Philip. And then along with the elders uh, of, of our denomination, as well as perhaps guests, uh, ministers of, of the Christian church, we will uh, set Philip apart for the gospel ministry. So that's what, that's what we're doing tonight. And so I'll invite Philip along with the commission to come uh, and join me in the front. And if there are uh, elders or ministers, even if you're not in the Presbyterian Church of America, you're welcome to come and join us uh, for this ordination. And I have uh, many questions. There are eight of them for Philip, which lay out the commitment he's making in serving as a minister and then I will have four, mem four questions for the members of the congregation. So Philip, uh, to each of these questions, if you could affirm them, say, I do or I will. Philip, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures, and do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will on your own initiative make known to your presbytery the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? I do. Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? I do. Do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? I do. Have you been induced, as far as you know your own heart, to seek the office of the holy ministry from love to God and a sincere desire to promote 
his glory in the gospel of his son? I do. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? I do. Do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a Christian and a minister of the gospel, whether personal or relational, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the flock of which God shall make you an overseer? I do. Are you now willing to take the charge of this church, agreeable to your declaration when accepting their call, and do you, relying upon God for strength, promise to discharge to it the duties of a pastor? I am and I do. Okay. For those of you who are counting, that was eight. I now have four uh, questions for the congregation. If you are a member of this church, I ask that you would raise your right hand, and if you could consent to these vows, say, we do. Do you, the people of this congregation, continue to profess your readiness to receive Philip Dennis, whom you have called to be your pastor? If so, say, we do. Do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? Do you promise to encourage him in the labors, in his labors, and to assist his endeavor for your instruction and spiritual edification? And do you engage to continue to him while he is your pastor that competent worldly maintenance which you have promised and that means will you continue to pay him his salary, <laughs> and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you. Our Father in heaven tonight, our hearts are so thankful to you. Thankful, first of all, for Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, at your right hand and ruling all things for his church. And tonight we sense, O oh Lord, by your promises that you are near to us. For you have set Philip apart to the wonderful ministry of prayer and ministry of the word. And as the apostles devoted themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, so we pray for Philip that he will be like the apostles and even more that he will be like our Savior. For the Savior said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. And we pray that your words will be his words. And like our Savior who said to his puzzled disciples, I have food that you do not know of. And he spoke of his intimate union and communion with you. We pray for Philip that his ministry of prayer will reflect that very intimacy with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that, that uh, will bear him forward in all that he does. We ask that as he rises in the morning, your words will come to his mind and Prayer will flow from his heart. Throughout the day, hour after hour, he will feed on you. And at night, as he and his family go to bed, that they will remember you and your promises and rejoice. Bless him with great love, we pray, for this church, your love. And bless this congregation with great love for him and his family. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for the work of grace that you began in Philip's life, a work that began when you chose him before the foundation of the world, the work that continued in his life when he came to a personal faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and affirmed his personal commitment to Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior, a work that continued as he grew in his faith and felt called to the ministry and pursued that call over years of going to school and 
learning about the ministry and trying different things. And we thank you for how that work was confirmed by the churches and the presbytery and for bringing him to this place where we're laying hands on him. Father, I pray that as he goes forward that his ministry might be out of the overflow of your work in his life. Father, that as he preaches the gospel, he might preach one who preach as one who's experienced the gospel, that as he proclaims salvation for sinners, he would remember that he is the chief of sinners. As he proclaims amazing grace, he would recognize that his ultimate hope is in your amazing grace. And Father, as he stands up in the pulpit and brings your word to the people, first he will have brought your word, you will have brought your word to his heart, and will be out of the overflow of that experience that he'll be able to share your grace with the people. Father, you are the one who's able to keep him from falling and to continue to draw him to yourself. You're the one who's able to sanctify him fully, and we pray that you would do that work, and that as he grows in holiness, he would also grow in humility. And as he grows in knowledge, he would also grow in awe of you. And as he grows in his skill, he would grow in his experience of utter dependence on your great grace through your Holy Spirit, and that ultimately his, test, his ministry, his success, the fruit of his ministry wouldn't be a testimony to his hard work, it wouldn't be a testimony to his skill or his abilities, but it would be a testimony to your unconditional grace through your Son and by your Spirit, we pray this. Amen. Lord Jesus, you're calling our brother this day to a position of paradox, uh, servant. Uh, Lord, called to take up a towel and a basin and to wash feet, to be willing to humble himself on behalf of uh, your people. And Lord, to be a warrior uh, called by your power to take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of uh, truth, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, which your word says is necessary to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Father, we recognize this day that he is not being set apart for a cloistered life, a monastic existence in a cottage and a parsonage and robes and rituals. But you have stationed this church on a battlefield where the kingdom of God is advancing against the kingdom of darkness. We pray that you would prepare our brother, equip him with everything good for doing your will. Help him to take up the basin and the towel and the sword and shield and to shepherd your flock well that you have purchased at the price of your own blood. And we ask that by your spirit's power you would do this for Philip's good and the church's good and for your glory. Amen. And Father, we, uh, we are grateful for this great occasion. And as we pray for Philip, we pray for him in the various roles that he now plays as a minister. We pray for him as a husband and father, that his heart would be filled with love for his family, and that his devotion to the church would not uh, cause neglect, but actually would help him uh, to further love and rest and find uh, delight in his home. We pray for him as a neighbor as a citizen of this country, we pray everywhere that he goes that he would adorn the gospel in a manner that is worthy uh, of any Christian, but as one who is now known as a leader in your church. And Lord, for his service here, we pray uh, that you would watch over him, uh, that he would be uh, quick to speak words of truth, uh, that he would be one who listens carefully to you and to those under his care, that you'd give him a heart of compassion for those in this church, and that he would look out beyond the, the walls and recognize during his season here uh, how uh, he might uh, go and gather those who uh, don't know the message of grace and who don't call upon you, that he would have a love and a heart for those who have strayed or those who don't know you. And we pray that wherever you would bring him in, in his future days, wherever uh, he may serve in the church or in the world, uh, that you would continue to shape and mold him to direct him, to watch over him, to protect him, and to use him, that during these short years on earth, uh, the investment he makes would be for bearing great fruit in the lives of individuals and for the strengthening of your church. And so we set him apart at this time for the gospel ministry. 
We pray that uh, indeed what we recognize is your call on him, uh, that tonight that we uh, welcome him with us and pray that you would bless the future of his ministry. Praying these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Philip, rise as we offer you the right hand of fellowship. I'm going to offer you your charge, and it comes from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. This book has a lot of words in it, almost three quarters of a million words. And there's more than that, words written about it. Millions and millions of words written about this word. Hundreds hundreds of words written about every verse in this book, and it's easy to get bogged down in all of those words. And in every passage you touch, every passage you study every week, for every, for every occasion you have to, to uh, preach, there's a plethora of linguistic and hermeneutical and historical and exegetical and cultural and theological issues that are going to be raised by that passage that it's going to be tempting to address. But now you're an ordained minister of the gospel. And your job is to cut through all of that stuff and preach the word. He doesn't say preach the words. He says preach the word. I believe there's an allusion, conscious or unconscious, to the prologue of John, where he says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The word is Jesus. So in other words, what he's saying is, whether you're preaching on Genesis or Jude or Revelation or Ruth, you've got to go from that passage to Jesus. Because your job now is not to offer lofty opinions about the theology and the exegesis and the hermeneutics and the syntax and all that stuff, but to bring people to Jesus. That is your job. The most learned man, perhaps an insightful man in the history of the church, was Paul the Apostle. But he talks about how he went to the church at Corinth and as he began his ministry, he resolved to know nothing, to be a know-nothing about anything except for one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's your job as well as you seek to follow in his footsteps. You know, there's a lot of important issues in this world around us. There's moral issues and political issues, economic issues, ethnic issues, and cultural issues that it's tempting to address. And every Sunday tempting to talk about these things because, you know, we pastors, believe it or not, we have opinions about these things, some stronger than others. And, you know, I find that some congregations, they even like it when we talk about these things. They go to church and they're hoping they'll get thrown a little bit of red meat that relates to their political point of view or their social concerns or things like that. And you might even have brilliant, insightful things to say about these things but it's not your job. You're being ordained today to preach the word, to preach Jesus. Avoid the temptation. Every Sunday, I think a good test, someone mentioned to me, is every Sunday when you stand up to preach, you need to say something that will be unacceptable to say at the local Democratic club, at the local Republican club, at the local Rotary club, at the Jewish youth club, at the Muslim Brotherhood Club, something that you couldn't say at a Mormon tabernacle because 
you're talking about Jesus. And that is the job. Every Sunday, do one thing. Preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And for you who are in his congregation, come with the words of those who, who came up to the disciples and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Come with the hope that somehow he's going to cut through the words, cut through the issues, and show us how Jesus is the answer. Because that's what we got. That's what he gave us, and that's what you're being ordained to do today. In another place, Paul writes, where is the wise man? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ and him crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You've got power entrusted to you. You've got wisdom entrusted to you, but it's the power of Christ wisdom of the gospel. Bring that to your people. That's what we've called you to today. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very encouraging service, this encouraging evening that we have together. What a great day for Christ's church. What a sign of your love for your people. And we thank you. And we thank you for the continuity of the leadership of the body of Christ going right back to Jesus himself. And we thank you that what we've been able to do here tonight is part of that great flow of, of the work of the Spirit from Jesus establishing his kingdom on earth and sending his people out to be um, his outposts of the kingdom uh, throughout history until he comes again. And thank you that you've given as part of that great continuity yet again tonight, as Paul said in Scripture, you've given pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. And we thank you that you're doing that again tonight, giving yet another pastor and teacher to the church so that we all can come to, the, uh, to maturity in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus himself, whose own blood has made a way for us to be reconciled to you and that through him, the body of Christ is established. So we pray that you will bless uh, the preaching of the death of Jesus and also the resurrection of Jesus. And even as we celebrate those sacraments tomorrow, baptism and the Lord's Supper, we thank you for those visible signs and for that visible continuity of the church going right back to our Savior, Jesus himself. And Father, we thank you also that through Jesus and with him, you have sent the Holy Spirit and you will empower uh, Philip's ministry and you will empower this church as they worship you and as they live as witnesses in Muncie and in this county, in the Presbytery and taking up their part in the worldwide work of the Lord. Thank you for gathering us then, Father, for this evening and thank you for your presence. And we look to you to do great things, even greater than we could expect. For we've gathered in Jesus' name, and we pray in his name now. Amen. We're going to sing now all for Jesus. We won't sing the refrain. We'll just begin with the verse, Let my hands perform his bidding. Thank you. 